video can stay on. Okay, mm -hmm. Judge, we're ready. All right, we have reached this case. This is position four on the calendar, 22 PO 7083, Yanel Francis Brown versus Adrian Jackson. Ms. Brown is represented by Ms. Koski, and Mr. Jackson is represented by Ms. McLaws now, um, and was previously represented by Mr. Shin, um, who filed an withdrawal. Um, this respondent filed a motion for modification on May 23rd of 2023, um, which looks like it was dated in early April of 2023 and not signed, um, but was filed in May of 2023. Um, the order in this case was issued in October of 2023, um, and the petitioner has filed a response to the respondent's motion at this time. So, um, because it is the respondent's motion, they get to go first as they bear the burden. And so, Ms. McLaws, do you just want to start, or would the parties prefer initial brief opening statements? Judge, before we start, I have a brief motion in limine to exclude certain um, evidence to be presented today, um, if I may be heard on that. That's fine. Yes, Judge. Um, I have reviewed the petitioner's motion. And it would appear to me that <clears throat> a motion in limine is proper to exclude the relitigation of the TPO. I will be asking the court to exclude any testimony regarding the validity of the TPO order, whether or not the verification is valid, whether the facts underlining the TPO are at issue today. And I would ask the court to issue an order limiting the testimony to the modification of Mr. Jackson's parenting time with the children at Nia's place. Um, I would also ask for a motion in limine to limit any testimony regarding the ability of Mr. Jackson to afford Nia's place as the same is free. There is no cost and we have a witness that will cooperate that. Um, that would be our motion uh, for the court so that this matter uh, doesn't expand as it has already been gone on appeal. It has been unsuccessful. Um, and so the only issue that the court should address today is a very limited and narrow issue of the modification of Mr. Jackson's parenting time. All right, Ms. McLaws, what is your response? First, Your Honor, I'd I would invoke the rule of sequestration. Um, I would like if there are any witnesses uh, uh, that they be excluded from uh, participating at this point in time. Okay, um, hold on, let me stop there. So I will invoke the rule of sequestration. Um, any witnesses, and I believe, trying to look on our screen here. Um, so any witnesses um, need to be, if they're present with other parties, need to be in another room out of earshot. And if they are online, they need to not be watching the live stream. Um, and not be discussing any of the hearing with anyone else and their testimony. Um, I believe the witness that the petitioner is referring to is in the waiting room. So she's not part of the main session at this time. Yeah, Judge, thank I you. No, I'm sorry, Ms. McClaws. I don't know if, if Ms. McClaws employed a court reporter. Um, and if she did, I would also like to participate and take down. I know that that was not made. I, think, I don't think we have a court reporter present on okay. this one. Got it. Thank you, Judge. Okay. I think we have one on another case, but not in this one. All right. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. McLaws. Your Honor, um, I'll respond to the motion in limine, and then um, I'll be moving to, uh, I'll, I'll address uh, any potential witnesses. I'll be moving to strike them. So I'd like to be heard on that uh, as a preliminary matter as well. Your Honor, under Mandate versus Lowell, it's M-A-N-D-T versus Lowell, L -O, or Lavelle, L-O-V-E-L-L, -L, 293 Georgia 807. It's a 2013 case. The court has the ability to modify a TPO, and we are here on a modification of the TPO. Um, my client doesn't intend on relitigating, calling police officers, that kind of thing. We're here on the motion to modify. And pursuant to Dallenberg versus Dallenberg, D-A-L-E-N-G, uh, I'm sorry, D-A-L-E-N-B-E-R-G versus Dallenberg, uh, 325 Georgia App, 
833. It's a 2014 case. The court can hear and, and should hear uh, testimony regarding um, the change in circumstances. My client should not be limited in any way to presenting evidence about the change in circumstances that have occurred. For example, um, the court will hear evidence that uh, the ch minor children are now in therapy um, and the effects of the TPO on that, uh, his ability to participate, his my client's ability to participate in schooling has been impacted. Um, it is, I would note for the court, and it is in our motion, that the petition was not verified. And I don't know why Ms. Koski keeps saying unsuccessful TPO. The TPO is pending um, the with the grandmother in the Court of Appeals. It's been briefed. But let um, me say, but this case, this one yes. was denied as untimely, correct? Well, correct. This case number. My, my client, want, because he wanted to be able to move to modify it. And once it was on appeal, the court would not have been able to do that. But didn't, so, but I received an order from the appellate court denying the appeal. The application, correct. My yes. client chose not to pursue that or take any further action on that so he could file the motion to modify Okay, um, well, just, just so I, everyone's aware, the order that I received said it was out of time. I understand, Your Honor, but my client would then have had the right to seek uh, additional review, a motion for reconsideration. Okay, so you're saying he is not but, doing that. I just want to be very clear what technically right. we are talking about. So he did not pursue that is what you are proffering. But as far as all parties are concerned, this case number is not on appeal at this time. That is correct. So okay. that you so that we can move forward with requesting the modification. And as I said, pursuant to Man Mandate versus Lau 293 Georgia 807, you have the right and the ability, uh, my client has the right to actually seek a modification of the TPO. And that's what uh, we are here today for. Uh, so to the extent uh, we don't intend on relitigating, but I don't believe that a motion on limine is proper with respect to what my client's testimony will be as to what the change in circumstances are okay all right and so what i'm going to say is this that the order has been issued mm -hmm. i'm not going to relitigate anything about that we're here solely on the motion to modify and why it should or should not be modified um, if he wants to go into some of what he alleges or change in circumstances he is free to do that um, but i will give it whatever weight i deem appropriate depending on what the evidence is um, yes, sir. But, um, and and as far as the verification, and, and I think the verification is not before the court at this time. It was never raised. Um, I don't think you have to raise a non-amendable defect in the record pursuant to 9-11-60. Uh, he can attack, collaterally attack a non-amendable defect. You don't have to raise it or object to it. Um, it was a non-amendable. So there's a, verific there's a verification. It just was not notified per the court record. It was not notarized is what is on the clerk's file in the record. It, it wasn't signed before a notary and there's no court order and the ex parte order does not indicate that the verification, the petition was verified in front of a judge. There's nowhere in this record that shows that uh, the move aunt, Mrs. Brown, ever actually signed a verification, um, or a lawful verification to the petition. And a non amendable defect means my client can collaterally attack that at any point. Over and you the, don't think latches applies at any point? No, not at all. 960D, a non amendable defect, um, he can attack, collaterally attack that. All right. And Ms. Koski, what is your response to that? Of course, Judge. First of all, <clears throat> Mrs. McClaw's if argument is true, would invalidate each and every single one of the TPOs that this court has issued for eternity. There's a specific procedure that this court has followed, particularly after COVID. There is a whole entire regimen online in which a party is presented with a packet, which includes a verification. I once again point Ms. McClaw's to 910.113. This is the applicable statute with respect to verifications on petition. The same says all affidavits, petitions, answer, defenses, or other proceedings required to be verified or sworn under oath shall be held to be sufficient when the same are sworn to before any notary, number one, any magistrate, number two, any judge of any court, 
or any other officer of the state county where the oath who is administered by the laws can authorize those oaths. This court specific procedure is as follows. You submit your petition, you submit your verification, you then appear before an magistrate who under oath verifies your petition and then grants you an ex parte. It is strict compliance with 910-113. That's point number one. Point number two, when Mrs. McClaws has now in three different courts alleged that there is no filed verification, it is a false statement. It is part of the record. It is the court's procedure to swear this individual as to her attestments before the court when she gets an ex parte order. This is a frivolous, frivolous argument. It was waived during the TPO. It was never raised. There was never anything mentioned about it. I agree that it is an amenable de fact. So even if I am entirely wrong on the code section, even if DeKalb County's history of dealing with TPOs and their online procedure is absolutely incorrect, it is an amenable de fact. It does not invalidate the TPO. Mrs. McClaws continues to make a frivolous argument before this court. It's not before the court today. We need to move on to the modification of Mr. Jackson's parenting time. Okay. Just one brief response, Your Honor. What, whatever the court's uh, procedure may be, the problem with this case is there's absolutely no evidence in the record whatsoever, anywhere, that Mrs. Brown was sworn in by a magistrate judge. It's not in any order. It's not in the transcript. It's nowhere. And Ms. Koski on appeal could not point to anywhere in the record where Mrs. Brown was sworn in. Uh, the it's not before a notary and there's nothing in the record. She cannot tell you today where in the record it actually shows that she was sworn in. Whether or not it's some it's a standard practice, it there's nothing in the record on this case that it ever actually happened. That's I'm so, the problem. I am That's so sorry. And and with all respect to this court, can we please share the screen? of this court docket, so she can, with her own eyes, see where the verification was filed in. There is nothing that requires that verification to have an affixed notary seal to it. So I'm, yeah, I'm not going to, to do that. There's a, there's a filed verification in, in the clerk's record. It, it has not been attacked up to this point, and we are here for a motion to modify. Right. And so I'm going to hear from the parties on the motion for modification and we'll we'll go from there okay yes, your honor, your honor right. with respect to my motion um it's my understanding uh i haven't actually been served with a copy of a subpoena um that a subpoena had issued uh that someone from nia's place uh is here pursuant to a subpoena um as the court knows 9 11 4 all subpoenas all pleadings and documents are required to be served um on council of record uh, Mrs. Koski was served with our motion to modify um, and well in advance of when it, she alleges that she had a subpoena issue. I, I haven't seen a subpoena, but I would move to strike uh, or limit any witness um, that had in fact been subpoenaed when Mrs. Koski failed to comply with statute and law. Uh, as the court knows, a party cannot um, you don't you're not allowed to send out bond subpoenas and then try to bring people into court 9-11-4 controls this matter all right miss koski all right first of all we were never served with the motion um despite mrs mcclaw's certificate of service she never emailed the motion to us she never mailed the motions to us um it was when uh the sheriff came looking for my client that we reached out to the clerk's office who emailed us a motion and we promptly filed um, our notice. Um, under our answer, we attached a number of exhibits. Exhibit number A was the Court of Appeals. Exhibit number B is the Nias Place report. And this is Mr. Jackson's motion where he himself has brought into issue what occurred with Nias Place. We further served Mrs. McClaws via regular mail with the subpoena of um, Nias Place. Uh, the same was done immediately upon issuance. The court does not file personal service subpoenas. I don't understand why Mrs. McClaws, uh, despite her arguments to the court as to why modification should be 
modified now wants to strike the main the main witness in in this case so my argument to the court is as follows i served it via mail i've attached the notices to our answer of the documentation that is going to be used and even your honor if it strikes there is a certificate of authenticity of business records and they can come in for two reasons i don't need mia's place here i would like them here but they are documents with a certificate of authenticity and i do not need the custodian to be here, and I can use them for impeachment purposes on Mr. Jackson. So for those three reasons, Mrs. McClaw's argument, once again, is frivolous. Okay, Your Honor, I have never received any subpoena from Vanessa Cosby. She claims she mailed it to me. There's no certificate of service, and there is an absolute requirement that you file a notice of subpoenaed witnesses on the record within six hours before a hearing. 9-11-4 requires service. Why would she mail me something when she's always emailed me things? And she claims repeatedly, not just in this court, but other courts, that she doesn't get responses. And then I attach the actual Okay, so, so I'm not gonna go into the history of, so both parties are saying they haven't received things. So here's right. what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you, because excluding relevant evidence is an extreme remedy, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a chance if you would like miss mcclaws to speak with the witness um before she testifies yes your honor i would like that thank you all right but i'm not going to exclude her testimony yes your honor um okay so we will take a break or i can give you a continuance no judge no. we would continue. okay okay i'm just checking i'm just trying to make sure so i, I just will give you a chance to speak with the witness um Ms. Koski, any objection to me placing her in a breakout room with the witness? Zero, Judge. Okay, all right. Ms. McClaws, I will place you in a breakout room with the witness, and um, I'll bring her in to let her know what we're doing, and then we will soon after continue the hearing and have the hearing, okay? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. All right, and we'll place you all in the waiting room and bring you back in shortly. Thanks. Anything further before we begin our motion? Uh, I just uh, want it noted for uh, the court that the witness indicated she was served with a subpoena June 5th and has turned over documentation. Um, I haven't received uh, any of those documents. They weren't, there was no indication as far as I knew uh, that the records would be requested in advance of a hearing. So I just want to make the court aware of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um... Are you ready to proceed on your motion, Ms. McLaws? Yes, Your Honor, I am. Okay, go ahead. Uh, would you like for me to swear the witness, Your Honor? Yes, please. Okay, I'll call Adrienne Jackson. Mr. Jackson, if you will unmute yourself. I will send a prompt. Okay, got it. Mr. Jackson, will you raise your right hand so the court can see you? Do you swear and affirm the testimony you're about to give before the courts, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? No. All right, Mr. Jackson, um, you uh, have filed a motion to modify the family violence uh, order relating to visitation with your children. Can you uh, tell the court what change in circumstances has occurred since the order was entered in October of 2022? My um, our children are having negative impacts of um, having negative impacts are and currently in um, therapy, um, actually therapy that I um, requested. I, I put in the request to have our children seen because I was concerned um, regarding the history and alienation and the impact that it would have on, on them and there was a three month wait and they actually got into the therapy, but I'm unable to participate in the sessions that I've actually requested um, for um, our daughter. Um, she's having uh, behavior issues, which I believe um, is a direct result of her not seeing her father um, and being limited to having access um to her father i think that the behavior i believe that the behavior issues that she's experiencing with her mother that her mother specifically states as a direct result of her alienating me from um their lives and um like then i knew that it would come into fruition it would start having um 
a negative impact on their social emotional well-being. Um, I set up the appointments and I like to be um, part of the, the therapy sessions and to have my um, input, my side of the story, my concerns heard. I'm unable to do that because of the um, a TPO, lack of visitation, as well as with their education. I'm unable to participate in any of the education um, feelings with our children. I've long been an advocate for education. I've always been responsible. I took the lead in terms of choosing their school, getting them to school, picking them up from school, doing homework, um, extracurricular activities, enrichment, um, and even um, after school care in terms of providing high quality educational after school care uh, with, <clears throat> with the programs at the school that I've actually enrolled our daughters in. I'm unable to, to, to be involved in that as well. And I believe all of these factors are negative impacting um, the social and emotional well-being of our children that could easily be um, remedied by my inclusion on the consistent basis I were before in their lives, not being supervised, just having the same parental time that I had um, before the TPO order. Uh, I'm never have ever been a threat to my children's safety or well-being. The mothers knows this. Um, the TPO is in fact retaliatory and punitive. And that's the only reason that it's in place is to hurt me and to hurt our children. Well, it hurts me, but by default, it ends up hurting the children. The court says they want to do what's in the best interest of the children, but so far, um, the best interest of the children hasn't been at the forefront of this issue. And um, those are my concerns. Let's talk for a moment about Nia's place. Um, you were ordered to attend supervised visitation with the children. Uh, did you in fact have some supervised visitation with the children there? I did have supervised visitation with the children there. Okay. And what were your, without talking about things the children said to you, what were your observations of the impact of having to see you in a supervised setting on the children? The children were confused. They wanted to know why they couldn't go to daddy's house. Um, why did they have limited time with me? It was literally an hour. And when it was time for me to leave, they cried. They couldn't understand why I had to go. They couldn't understand why they couldn't see me more. It's really traumatizing for the, for the children. Um, they're dual language learners, and I wasn't even able to just simply speak basic Spanish. Hello, how you doing? I love you. Um, they forced me, and I try to, I try to, I always try to instill the dual language language, even though I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker. I speak as much Spanish as I can with the children so they can pick up on the language and I can learn the language as well. And Nia's place, you know, <laughs> told me I had to speak um, English. If, if I was a fluent Spanish speaker, I was speaking basic Spanish words. I love you, colors, numbers, the, which I've always done with them. It's nothing abnormal. And they was like, well, you can't speak any Spanish to them. So my regular routine with the students was with the children, with uh, our children was, was was disrupted in a manner that caused trauma um, on them because I couldn't socialize and interact with them on the way that I normally would. Now, was there an incident that occurred on January 10th, 2023? Yes. Okay. What happened that day? That day, the children came into the room where we were to visit, and I noticed that their ears were pierced. They had had pierced ears, um, and the pierced ears was in violation of the court order that requires us to communicate about all things regarding the children, um, ear piercings, including medical decisions, extracurricular activities, and the whole nine. And um, the children's, my oldest daughter's ears was pierced initially, and she got a severe infection that, 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 that had to be treated in urgent care um, because of neglect uh, on the mother's part. And the ears got infected. They also have eczema, asthma, and allergies. And all that plays a role in uh, really having to be careful and really manage any type of piercings on their skin. 
um, so we once the um, infection that had happened, we decided that the children um, we wouldn't put earrings in the in the oldest daughters. Can ear. I ask for a clarification? What time are we talking about when the the infection happened? The infection happened uh, probably a couple years prior to this okay. whole thing, okay. um, and um, so we chose not to pierce the ears, not to re-pierce it. And then uh, um, our two-year-old, our three-year-old Andriana ears was never pierced. And uh, me and the mother had, 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 she had discussed wanting to pierce our daughter's ears again. And um, I stated my objection to that. And so uh, we had uh, decided that before we make a final decision, we would consult a, a, a specialist, a physician, and talk to them about the children's medical history, issues with the infection, the history with the allergies, eczema, and um, allergies, eczema, and asthma. Um, also, they um, are, are prone to scarring um, as well as with the piercing. And we would get professional advice. Um, and the mother knew that I was adamantly against piercing, making a decision before we consulted a professional. and. Um, she chose to pierce the ears anyway, and I noticed the ears was pierced when they came to the visit. So I simply removed the earrings out of concern and safety for our children uh, because of the history. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong per se at Nia's place. Um, and uh, when I was, when it was brought to their attention, I explained to them why I removed the earrings. Um, I placed the earrings in my pocket and I sat down on the couch and continued the, 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 the visitation with our children. If I'm not mistaken, I only removed the earrings from our oldest daughter. I did not remove the earrings, I don't recall, from uh, the youngest daughter. Because um, the oldest daughter had the history of the infection. Um, even though I was concerned with the, the youngest daughter having the same history, I just was more concerned about the older daughter at that point because of the emergency room visit and the infection. Um, I told Neil's place that I had placed the earrings in my pocket and sat down and when they asked me to return them, I searched my pockets and they weren't in my pocket. So I told the, the staff that I believe they fell out of my pocket onto the couch or onto the floor and I couldn't find them. They wrote a letter that really changed the narrative in terms of my attitude and tone regarding the whole earring incident, saying that I, I refused to return the earrings when that wasn't in fact the case. I didn't have the earring. They fell out of my pocket and they was lost. So um, they suspended my visitation because of that incident, me removing the earrings from my oldest daughter and claiming that I, I refused um, to actually return the earrings. I had no, no reasons to keep the earrings. They just got lost in the hour visit somewhere in that room. And I notified them of that, but they wrote a letter and completely changed the tone and narrative of the incident. Um, I almost, when I read the letter, gave the indication that I was in some way hostile and belligerent and uh, uncooperative and just refusing to give them the earrings back when I just didn't have the earrings to give back. They were somewhere in that visitation room and I let them know that. Now, have you, uh, so it's your understanding that you cannot exercise parenting time at Nia's place, correct? Absolutely cannot. They, they sent the letter stating that. Okay, so that would be a change in circumstances since the court's order that you yes, can't visit at the place that was designated. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Right, and also but, not even I couldn't even communicate with them about the reasons why I couldn't visit. They, they barred me from even calling to inquire and ask questions and try to get some, some clarity and understanding. Through me, did you attempt to resolve whatever the issue was with Nia's place through me? Did. I had you as my attorney because I was barred from even making a phone call and discussing the issue per the letter that they sent out, uh, which I gave to you and you read and um, asked you if you could operate in my behalf and try to get the issue uh, resolved in an amicable way. And to your knowledge, did anyone from Nia's place ever respond to my overtures to try to uh, get the situation resolved? They did not respond whatsoever. Okay. Um, were you aware of any specific policy for Nia's place that advised you that you could not remove the children's earrings? No, I was not. 
Did you strike anyone no. uh, on January 10th? Did you threaten to harm anyone on January the 10th, 2023? Absolutely not. Not on that day or any other day. I would never do that. Have you violated the court's family violence order by um, going to the children's school? No, ma'am. Have you violated the court's uh, restraining order by going to the children's um, home? No, ma'am. Have you violated the court's uh, protective order in any way? Absolutely not. And do you have a contempt action against Ms. Brown currently pending in the Superior Court of Fulton County? I do. I do and have several contempt actions pending. And we're set to go to trial on that next month, correct? have an objection, Your Honor. I don't believe that that question is relevant to this cause of action. We're not here on a contempt matter. No, it, I, I was going to ask what's going on with the family court case, just so I have some parameters in my mind. Um, so I'm going to overrule the objection for him to just answer that question as to what the contents of it are and what's going to happen. That's obviously not relevant to today. But knowing that there may be a ruling in the future that may be grounds for modification of this order in the future is just something for me to know. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Without getting into uh, all of the specifics, but we have uh, a final trial scheduled next month in July on your petitions for contempt of the parenting plan um, violations you allege Ms. Brown has um has done, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, Mrs. Brown had, uh, and, and I um, just want to ask you one question on that. Mrs. Brown had filed a contempt relating to summer visitation that she withdrew in trial. Is that correct? Judge, I'm going to object to the question regarding a closed matter on another contempt that has already been dealt by Fulton County. Your Honor, it's relevant because it helps to establish the difficulty and the change in circumstances that my client has had and what he's been dealing with and why we're asking for the court to modify this order. Um, I think it is extremely relevant that Mrs. Brown filed a motion to stop him from having visitation and then withdrew it the day of court. Judge, we filed a contempt for Mr. Jackson withholding the children then the TPO was handled, which made the contempt moot. Thus, it was withdrawn. There's been a final order on the contempt. There's been a final order on the TPO. This line of questioning is irrelevant. Okay. What, what time frame? Are you, yeah, I don't know that the reasonings behind it being withdrawn or not. I, it, I'm going to overrule the. I'm going to. I'm going to overrule the objection. Allowed to say that there was a contempt in place by the petitioner, and it's not in place anymore. All right. So yes. I'll allow, I mean, I, that's what he, or he can answer that question if you want. Um, Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Jackson, uh, Mrs. Brown had alleged you would held the children and had filed an emergency contempt. Is that correct? That's correct. And at that hearing, you had evidence that you had provided her notice of the summer visitation. Judge, again, I'm going to object this has already been, it's done. Okay. Rest at, this, at this point, I'm going to sustain the objection as to what he had ready or not ready at that time. There wasn't a hearing and it's not before this court. Your Honor, may I, may I have the courtesy of just responding, please? You I may. understand. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the reason it's relevant is it shows a pattern of behavior by Mrs. Brown in alienating the children. Why it is so very important it, from my client's perspective that the children are being impacted and it's not in their best interest to not have visitation. Mrs. Brown is here today. I believe she's going to say he should have no visitation. I think it's important for the court to understand this is a pattern of conduct. Okay, so so I I'll, I'll, I I hear that, and I'm also just going to note that I already have ordered supervised visitation, and Thank I'm you. at a point where I'm deciding whether there are sufficient grounds to modify it. There's already been alleged a pattern of manipulation between both parties. And so I'm not going to go too much into, you know, the family court case is the long-term solution for all of this. Yes, sure. And, and so that's for family court. Um, I'm, I don't have the benefit of a guardian ad litem. I don't have all of that. Um, so this is just temporary. And specifically, there's an order to 
there's a motion before the court on whether to modify this current order before the court. And so that's what I'm going to look at. All right. So let's not get too much into history of the parties because that's been mentioned exhaustively, I think, even in the 12 month hearing. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Mr. Jackson, what are you asking the court to do today? I'm asking the court to modify the visitation to unsupervised visitation um, prevalent to the, 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 the agreement that we have. There's no history of violence, uh, period, uh, specifically me towards the children. The mother, if she's being honest, would never say that she fears for the safety, well-being, and welfare of the children when they're in my care. Um, the attorney, I feel, really, and, and on behalf of the mother, is doing the supervised visitation punitively um, and, um, and just in terms of, um, I say punitively and retaliatory towards me. And it doesn't serve the best interests of our children. Literally my three-year-old at the appointment says, why can't I go to daddy's house? Um, they, your they, they, Ms. McLaughlin? they want to be with me. Hold on, and, sir. Your Honor. Your Honor, I believe when the child made the statement, it was either an excited utterance or a present sense impression of what she's saying, and it would be allowable as a hearsay exception. I've not heard who it was made to or any of the circumstances that that was made. So I'm going to sustain the objection at this point. Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Jackson, when you were speaking with your, your children prior to the entry of the uh, uh, supervised visitation requirement, when was that approximately? Say, when did I see my children prior to the? When did the children make the state, the, the children make a statement asking why they couldn't go to your house? When was that? Again, Judge, I'm going to have to object on the basis of hearsay. What is being solicited from Mr. Jackson is an out of court statement offered in court for the truth of the matter, sir. It is clear hearsay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to rule on that yet. I'm going to see if she can lay a foundation and then we'll go from there. Um, but let me say this. Children love their parents. Um, and whether they're traumatized by the supervised visitation is not on its own grounds to warrant a modification because there's a reason these things were put in place in the first place. And there's other kinds of trauma children can endure. And so I, I, I'm allowing some leeway on this topic, but I'm, I'm going to ask me right into change of circumstances. Um, okay, Ms. Gloss, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, where were the children when they made the statement to you? In the um, visitation room at, at um, Mia's, Nia's place. Okay. And do you recall approximately when that was? As soon as they entered the room to visit with me. Okay. And was that something your children... Uh, said as I entered the room or was it during a period of just back and forth conversation? They said that immediately upon entering the room, once we sat down and started visiting, my youngest daughter, the three-year-old literally said, I want to go to daddy's house. Why can't I go to daddy's house? Okay. Now you heard what the court said as far as a uh, visit, supervised visitation was put into place. Whether or not you agree with that, if the court were to allow the visitation to change from Nia's place to a different supervising agency uh, as, a, as an alternative, would you agree uh, that you would be responsible for paying for the supervised visitation? Yes. And are you asking the court to allow you to be able to visit with your children, whether it's supervised or not? I'm asking the court to do what's in the best interest of our children and allow me to keep the same unsupervised visitation that I had with my children prior to the TPO because I'm not any threat to my children, never have been. I haven't been a threat to anyone. There's no reason for me to have supervised visitation. Okay, we're not going to relitigate this. And it sounds like that's what's happening at this point. Yes. So, Mr. Jackson, understand the court's orders in place. So. Uh, and it requires supervised. Would you be willing to pay for supervised visitation at some other place other than Nia's place so that you can you can rebuild your relationship with the kids? I need to see my, my our children. That's important that I have um, 
involvement, um, um, consistent involvement. And another thing with the Nia's place, there wasn't any consistency in terms of me seeing the children in a, 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 a suitable time frame because of the mother really not being um, helpful in terms of coordinating the schedule. I could either see my children one time a month or once or, or twice in the span of three days because of the way they do their schedule or once every 16 days. And they weren't, Nia's place wasn't, wasn't um, supportive and trying to produce a schedule between me and the mom that would allow me to see the children in a manageable and reasonable space of time. That was an extreme, either once a month, um, back to back within three days or once every um, 16 days. They just would, would not, um, encourage the mom and I to work our schedule in a way that I could at least see the kids once a week, which was, I believe the order was every, every week. And it went from that because of the, the schedule conflicts and you know, the mother really being unreasonable in terms of being flexible, even though I was being as flexible as I could to allow some consistency. So were there difficulties uh as you understood with Mrs. Brown uh, indicating she could not bring the children? Yeah, she said she couldn't bring the children on specific days. Her schedule wouldn't allow it. And, and um, as flexible as, as I was, she only had one option and it was either that or nothing. And it, that changed because originally it was set up for once a week. The mom agreed to it. And then I got a call saying that she reneged on that agreement. And I couldn't understand that. And Neil's place was basically like, well, she has a right to do Judge, that. Judge, I'm going to object to any hearsay testimony. Ms. McLaws. I don't believe he's offering uh, the statement by who he got a, a call from as the truth of the matter asserted, as much as it's explaining why uh, he is asking for a modification. Um, I can cross-examine Ms. Brown on all that. I don't think that's what he's offering it for, okay. but explaining yeah. the difficulties. It, it, it sounds like it was both. It was the truth. He's saying she was making it difficult for him to have consistent visitation. So I am going to sustain the objection to hearsay. Okay. So if the court it will modify the order, are you asking for specific parameters to be put in place requiring parents visitation once per week um, on a designated day? I would like as much parent visitation as I can get. If that's once a week or twice a week, three times a week, I need to see my kids as much as possible, but I, I need some consistency. They need, we need consistency where I see them on a regular basis and not over a span of um, a month or over two weeks or 16 days spaced in between. Um, I would like for all parties involved to, to agree that it's important to, to provide a consistent schedule for me to parent with the children, with our children um, at a reasonable and fair time frame. That's all I have, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Ms. Koski, you may cross-examine. Yes, um, Mr. Jackson, um, this temporary protective, the, the one-year protective order was entered October, 2022, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. And in that order, you were granted visitation at Nia's place, correct? Granted supervised visitation at Nia's place, correct. And that visitation was to start within 14 days of the entry of the order, correct? It was to start within 14 days, but it did not because the mother did not do the orientation in time. And um, so it actually got pushed back. My visitation got delayed because the mother didn't follow the order. In fact, you had visitation November 27th, 2022. Is that right? Visitation sometimes after the 14 day time frame because I went begging for, to, for my visitation to start and it couldn't start because the mother didn't go through the orientation. So it actually pushed back the um, parenting time that I was supposed to have within 14 days. So it did start. But like I said, the mother did not follow the order and I had to wait an additional 
I want to say two weeks before my parenting time could actually start when the mom actually decided to make it a priority to get there and do the, um, the orientation. Mr. Jackson, you had visitation November 27th, November 29th, December 11th, December 13th, December 20th, December 27th, December 23. So when you represent to this court that you went days without seeing your children, that is not a true statement. Is that right? No, you're not making a true statement. What I said was there was an agreement that prevented me from seeing the children on a consistent basis because the mother wouldn't be flexible in her scheduling. To your point, you just said in the beginning that I saw them back to back within the span of three days. After that, I couldn't see them for another 16. I don't have the schedule in front of me, but what happened was once I said, I can't go 16 days in a row without seeing my children, three days back to back is um, too close, we ended up with an, an agreement where um, I saw them, if I'm not mistaken, and there was some, some, some dates that it wasn't available because of holidays, Christmas and whatnot. Um, but I typically, because I changed my schedule um, and was able to, to see them, I believe, uh, once a week, once we got past that initial two or three week period in the beginning where there was some, the visitation was up in the air and it was either once a month, because that was put on the table. Look, if you can't agree, if you can't change your schedules, you can only see them once a month. And I said, absolutely not. That's not going to work. So we got to the point where I had to change my schedule where I could see them um, once a week after that initial problem in the beginning. You testified earlier today that as a result of the supervised visitation, your children need therapy. However, you have no evidence here to show that your children are in therapy because of the supervised visitation other than your testimony, correct? I didn't say that. I did not say they need therapy because of the supervised visitation. I said I was well aware in the beginning, even before the TPO order, that because of the history of alienation of the mother against me and our children, that I knew they would ultimately end up needing therapy. And I actually set an appointment for it months before the TPO order was even in place. It was on a three to six month waiting period. Thank Once you, Mr. I got called, then I was able to, they was able to start the therapy, but at that point I couldn't participate in the therapy that I requested because of the TPA order. And the mother herself said that they have developed behavior issues. And that behavior issues is because they're not seeing their daddy. Mr. Jackson, you also testified that they have changed in their behavior since the supervised visitation. However, other than your blanket statement that there are changes in the behavior, you have no specific instances to show from November 27, 2022 to January 10th, 2023, when your children showed different behavior while exercising parenting time, correct? Testimony, ma'am. Okay. Um, you also testified that their education has been impacted. Sir, other than your statement that their education has been impacted, you have no evidence today to show that there's a material change in circumstances in the well-being of your children to show that their education has been impacted. The education has indeed been impacted. They're not going to school on a regular basis. They're no longer attending the quality after school program that we both agreed on. Um, I'm limited to the extracurricular activities that they were engaged in when I had um, my parenting time with our children. So yes, they've been impacted severely. You signed certain documents before starting at Nia's place. In fact, you went into an orientation. Is that not true? Did went, go into an orientation. There was a, a, a document process that they fill out. And that orientation provided certain parameters for you to be able to exercise visitation at Nia's place, correct? And one of those parameters included not altering the children's appearance and or clothing. Is that right? I did not alter their clothing or their appearance. I simply removed earrings that shouldn't have been there in the first place. And my concern was at the general well-being of our daughter because the infection that she received from earrings prior and they was an agreement that we would not pierce their ears. And I was Mr. Jackson, let me stop you. I'm so sorry. I, I hate to stop you. Any opportunity to have a say, and that's in the court order. Mr. Mr. Jackson, 
Okay, so here's what I've let it. So I need you to answer yes or no, and then you may explain your answer. Okay. okay. All right. Go ahead, Miss Koski. Mr. Jackson, the question was very simple. Pursuant to the guidelines signed at Nia's place after orientation, you agreed that you would not alter their clothing or their appearance. That is one of the rules, correct? That's no, a yes that's or no. no. You did not, not agree to that. I did not, I, I did not alter their appearance or their clothing. Okay. Taking off a child's earring is not altering their appearance. Okay. You also testified that the piercing of the ears is a violation of your parenting plan order. I assume from the original legitimation. Yes. Okay. Under what topic does piercing somebody's ears fall under? It falls under, we are discuss anything relative to the children in terms of medical, education, insurance. We're supposed to make we're supposed to have communication regarding every issue concerning the children. And of course that includes piercing their ears, specifically when there's been a history of infection. She knows our children have eczema, asthma, and allergies. All that plays a role in whether or not you should do certain things like piercing the ears. You testified that the ear uh, infection in the earlobe was years ago and not present at your last visitation in January 23rd at Nia's place, correct? Well, years ago, we both agreed that they wouldn't be re-pierced. And it okay. should have been a conversation under the parenting plan if a decision to pierce the ears was going to be made. I was supposed to be, um, we were supposed to have a conversation about it. And we, in fact, did. And the agreement was to consult a medical professional before we make any moves on piercing the ears. You also, um, in the guidelines to Nia's place, you also agreed that only English would be spoken at Nia's place, correct? There was no indication on whether or not you could speak um, English or Spanish in the agreement. Okay. When you filed this uh, petition for modification um, under, under oath, uh, you told this court that you wanted your supervised parenting time to be stopped and you wanted normalized parenting time. Is that right? I don't know specifically if that's in the, um, the motion to modify, but I would like normalized visitation with the children because I believe that's in their best interest. And I, they've shown that the supervised visitation is traumatizing. Now, you have also pled in your motion, paragraph seven, particularly, that supervised visitation needs to stop because you just can't afford it. Is that right? No, ma'am, that's not correct. That's not I, what you put in your motion? I, I was well aware that the supervised visitation is free. If it says that in the motion, it's because my attorney drew that up and she wasn't aware that, there was, that, was, that it was free. But I never said that there was a charge. I'm aware that it was that it's free. Okay. Um, what, if anything, have you done to find new places that would provide for supervised visitation? What I did was try to communicate with Mia's place to try to come to an amicable resolution because I believe it was just a minor misunderstanding and a minor um, disagreement, a, a, a misunderstanding, and they refused to communicate with me at all about it. So they actually suggested I refer back to the courts. So that's what I did. All right. And your visitation was stopped in January. Yes. All right. And today it is June 14th, correct? Yes. And in fact, your modification was filed actually four months to the date that when your visitation was stopped. So from January to May, you did nothing to see your children, did you? Not true. That's absolutely false. And you know that's false. I have nothing further. As to the paragraph seven in the motion, um, you understand that if the court modifies the supervised visitation requirement, that you might have to pay for that, correct? That's correct. And how much money do you earn? Uh, what? Let me ask you this. You're under contract with the, um, with the school system, correct? Yes, ma'am. I'm a bus operator. I drive school children to school and from school and extracurricular activities every day during the school year. Okay. And you're uh, paid monthly. Is that monthly. correct? I'm monthly. 
Right. And you receive approximately $1,900 per that contract per month? Yes, I believe that's correct. That's all I have. Judge, I need to get one document briefly for impeachment purposes. Can I be allowed three minutes? You may. Okay, what we're going to do is take a five minute break so I can take an announcement on some of the cases that were scheduled for 11 a.m. and then I'll bring you all back. Thank you, Your Honor.